Okay, hi everybody, welcome back to the sixth in our series of live topic revision sessions. Uh, we've done lots of things, we've done growth, we've done cycles, monetary policy, fiscal policy, trade, globalization. So I thought we'd take a walk on the supply side for our sixth session. And uh, don't forget all these videos are recorded, available to view on YouTube obviously, but also on the archive section, tutor to you.net forward slash live and just go to events, replay, click economics, and you can download all of the sessions and all the PowerPoints that go with them. If you're looking for a little extra revision support in your studies. And we're also going to be going pretty heavy on Instagram uh, in the next couple of days with lots of revision support for paper two. And then next week, of course, paper three, as we head into the final week of the economics exams. So if it's okay with you, I thought we'd spend 20, 25 minutes or so looking at supply side economics. The aim being actually to give you lots of good examples, because the evidence seems to be that this is an area of, this, of the course where having those specific examples can make such a big difference. Contextual awareness makes a huge difference to the quality of your answers. We start off, of course, with a bubble quiz. Here we go. So I'm going to pose four questions for you. They can either be, uh, well, the answers can be A, B, C, or D, obviously. <laughs> But the number of answers that are correct can range from zero to all four. Here's our first question. Which of these countries has a or have a higher labor productivity than the UK as measured by GDP per person employed? Which of these four countries, if any, have higher labor productivity than the UK? Those of you watching live and hundreds of people joining us for this session, uh, post your answers in chat and we'll do our best as always to put up some great answers in the exam, exam questions. Joe has gone for ACD. Olivia, BCD. Uh, Gabrielle has gone for A and D. Emily, B and D. Armin thinks it's all four and Sophie thinks it's A, C and D. Let's check. 
Congratulations to those people who chose A, C, D, including Sophie. USA, Italy, and France. The United States has a level of per capita productivity per person employed, something like 30% higher than the UK, but we are ahead of Japan. Unknowingly, French are ahead of us. Next question. Oh yeah, I like this one. This is a kind of classic supply side knowledge stat. Which of these nations are in the world's top five for 5G speed and availability? What do we reckon on this one? The, ship, the countries I've chosen are Hong Kong, the UK, Germany, and South Korea. Okay, what do we reckon here? Luke's gone for A, B, D. Finn thinks it's A and C, and Daniel think, thinks it's A, B, D. Uh, what do we think? Uh, and, yeah, Seth thinks it's A, C, D. Safa thinks no, just A and D. So what do we think here? A couple more. Colmat thinks it's A and D. Antonio thinks it's A and D, and so does Joe Wilson. Let's have a look at the answer. It is indeed. Yeah, Germany doesn't come in the top five, comes in the top 10. But uh, there's two great examples to use of the 5G connectivity, speed, availability, video on demand. So, uh, Hong Kong, pretty high. South Korea, I think, streets ahead. This is one of those kind of nice, quirky competitiveness uh, bits of knowledge to have that uh, some countries are well ahead of the UK in terms of 5G. Here's another question for you. Which of these businesses are privately owned rather than state owned? Which of these businesses are privately owned rather than state owned? This is another aspect, isn't it, of economics. Channel 4, the London Northeastern Railway, Ordnance Survey, the Royal Mail. Which of these businesses do you think are... <laughs> Jim says we use 7G in the GTG office. Jim's actually got a, a, an iPhone 15. I don't know if you've got an iPhone 15 yet. The screen touches you. So good. Bruce thinks it's A and D. Victoria thinks it's A and D. Um, Evan thinks, what are, the, what are the other three? Oh, that for 5G, of course. Okay. Um, Matthew thinks it's D, B and A, privately owned. What do we reckon? Uh, Sanvi says, no, it's only D. It's only D, and Ismail agrees. It's only D. Sean, Sean Singh says it's D only. Let's check. Well, well done to those three. Tremendous answers. Yeah, Channel 4 is currently state owned, although Nadine Doris wants to change that. London Northeastern Railways has changed hands over the years. This is the line from London to Aberdeen. And it's, uh, it's now state owned. London Northeast Railway took over the franchise from oh gosh one of the private sector businesses a few years ago ordnance survey the mapping company is state-owned uh royal mail was of course was privatized first of all in 19, 2013 and then fully privatized in 2016. there we go and uh, one more question for you which of these oh yes i like this question which of these have a higher top rate marginal tax rate in other words which of these countries have that a high tax rate Bigger than the UK. So the UK, of course, is actually somebody post in chat. What is the highest income tax rate you can pay in the UK? Somebody post in chat. What is the highest marginal tax rate? And I'll give you a shout out. Yeah, Pedro is saying Channel 4 is undergoing privatization. It is, but it hasn't yet happened. Uh, the screen touches you. Yes, Eden, that's one of my better jokes. Um, yeah, okay, you agreed. 45%. Is the top rate tax on the UK. So which of these countries have a higher marginal tax rate than the UK? What do we reckon? Uh, answers coming through. Rowan, Rowan says B and D. Robert Buxton says D. He's pretty sure about French. Alex Belay says C and D. Olivia says A and C. And Dan Piper says A, C, D. And Gabriella says, well, she's pretty confident she's going to be C. Let's check the answer. It's C and D. Uh, Singapore has very low top rate tax. Estonia, again, flat tax system. So those are two good examples of countries with low top rate taxes. You can find those out. You just Google. You just go to trading economics. You can find them out. Somebody's fact checking me this afternoon already. So thank you for that. But it's good idea to have a couple of examples of countries where taxes are high in marginal terms, Denmark and France, and countries where taxes are low for on income. You don't need to know the figures. If you said, for example, in an exam question, 
Uh, Denmark and France have higher marginal tax rates than countries such as Estonia and Singapore. That is application. That's good application and you get the credit. So don't worry about having the exact stats. A lot of students do have them, including lots on this live stream. You don't necessarily need them to get the, to get the application marks. Okay, moving on. Here we go. Uh, over to you. Uh, can you please give me three aims of supply side policies? 30 seconds. What can you come up with? Have a go. Oh, some good answers coming through. Our uh, improved productivity, uh, SAGAR, improved labour mobility, increased productive potential. It's important to have some aims in your revision notes uh, because then you can think about the extent to which those aims are achieved. Mia talks about improving competitiveness. Nat Beacon, Beaton sorry, talks about increasing productivity. And uh, yeah, okay, Charlie, good point. Charlie McDevitt, improve the quality and quantity of factors of production. It's a great answer. Uh, oh, Ellen Revel, increase long and aggregate supply, improve mobility of labour and increase productivity. Uh, some good answers there, terrific answers. By the way, it's quite we can't put every answer on the screen. We do our best. Uh, if you've got a particular question during the session, you think, oh, Riley hasn't answered that properly or he's ignoring me, just post it in the comments section of the video and we'll do our best. We'll go in afterwards and we'll do our best to answer any questions in comments and maybe link to some resources. And by the way, Jim's doing his best. Jim's my production manager. Um, he's also my stunt double. And he's next door trying to put these great contributions on the screen at the same time playing the guitar for the music. It's not easy. Three aims, crucial aims. One, improve incentives to work. This is really important, particularly in the context of the fact that we've had a big rise in economic inactivity in the UK just in the last few years. There's been nearly half a million people of working age, <clears throat> pardon me, who are no longer actively looking for work in the UK. That's one of the reasons why there's labour shortages. Investing people's skills, I'd definitely be looking for people to talk about human capital. Shout out there to Sh Charlie's Loth, what have you. Increased investment, research and development. The UK economy underinvests and has very low R&D spending. It's less than 2% and that all ties in with competitiveness, obviously, globally. Point three is quite detailed, but I think it, it's one of those lines that if you, if you get it right, it's a brilliant line. One of the aims of supply side policy is to improve the trend rate of sustainable growth of GDP to help support improved living standards and better regional balance. Point three would be maybe one or two percent of students would use that because you're bringing in sustainable growth. So then you start thinking, well, which supply side policies are best for that? How can we grow renewable capacity, for example? Living standards, leveling up, all that kind of stuff is really important. OK, moving on. Um, when you're revising supply side, as many of you will be over the weekend, I'm sure, <clears throat> pardon me, very useful to make two distinctions. One, supply side policies that are really focused or geared for the labour market, labour supply, uh, incentives, skills, etc. Uh, and supply side policies to uh, for product, I should say product markets, sorry. So markets for goods and services, okay? Designed to make markets work better. So labor market versus product market, one distinction. And then what type of policies? Are they more kind of free market policies, neoliberal free market policies, which have a place? Or are they more towards the government intervening in markets to address one or more market failures? So with that in mind, let's just test you as a group. We've got nearly 500 students in the, in the session live. We're going to get some amazing answers. Can you please give me three examples of free market supply side policies? Have a go.
thank you for those. Naomi Scott was very quick off the mark with three great policies there. Uh, Sean saying reduction income tax, corporation tax, and reduction in power of unions. Lewis, change corporation tax, change income tax, and increase minimum wage. Ah, minimum wage wouldn't be a free market policy, Lewis. We're going to come on to that actually in this session. Matthew Best, unemployment benefits and tax, education and healthcare, privatization and deregulation. And Scott talks about deregulation of hiring and firing laws in the labor market. Interesting points. By the way, we also noticed how consistent Jim's guitar playing is on each of these 30 seconds. It's really quite impressive. Here's my answers. Three markets apply to our policies. Now, there's many you could choose. I've just chosen three areas. One is deregulation and privatization. So deregulation, opening up markets to more competition. Privatization, of course, involves the transfer of ownership. And you may, and here's a really handy point ahead of the weekend. You probably revised lots of markets, lots of industries for your micro paper, and they probably didn't come up. Don't forget, you can use a lot of micro in any question on supply side policies, and you will be given credit. In fact, there's a question coming up shortly, which we're going to have a go at, which is essentially, well, this is micro, isn't it? No, it's a supply side policy applied to the labor market. So the stuff you revise for micro, you can bring into macro as well. Don't forget also, once you've revised micro and macro for Monday, macro for Monday, obviously, you're in great shape because there's not much more to revise. You've basically revised the course. Then you just need to fine tune your synoptic skills for paper three. Free trade, free movement of labor and capital. So a lot of free market economists favor free trade deals and moving away from protectionism. They, they favor free movement of labor, free movement of financial capital. That would be good policies. And a lot of people talk about this, they move towards flexible labor markets, including things like zero hours contracts, flexible play, fe flexible pay, short term contracts, that kind of stuff. I would be just be wary of just talking about reducing union power. The danger is that's probably that happened in the 80s and the 1990s because I was there. OK, but it hasn't really happened very much at all in the UK context in the last 10, 15 years. If anything, unions are making a little bit of a comeback, particularly in the States. OK, so those were three market policies. Over to you this again on the next slide. Can you fill the chat window with examples of interventionist supply side approaches? What can you do in 30 seconds? A great question, Kevin, from Anya there. I don't know if you can pick it up, Jim. Uh, Anya talking about our subsidies, uh, free market or interventionist. They would be clearly, there, there's the question from Anya. Are subsidies interventionist or free market? The answer is interventionist. So subsidies in farming or healthcare, whatever it is, that's a, it's an interventionist approach. And there were loads of good answers coming through, which we, which we try to pick up on. Things like nationalization, infrastructure investment, labor market interventions. Tom Hurst talks about education and trading. Ah, thank you for mentioning that, Tom. I'll come back to that. Lewis makes the obvious but important point. Invest in infrastructure, allowing Jeff to watch Newcastle more. Uh, well, that assumes, uh, Lewis, that I haven't bought a flat next to the stadium in time for the 23-24 season. But uh, Lewis, obviously a big fan of the word invest. Uh, Lisa, so we can go back to Lisa's point if we can. Depending on education, investment infrastructure like HS2, subsidy. Yeah, great points there. Some super points there. Uh, let's look at my examples. And then I've got a very important point I want to make. Uh, literally, we all have to literally sit down and listen. <laughs> State ownership of key businesses and industries. Well, again, you see, you can make a case for saying that nationalizing the water industry or nationalization of the energy sector could be a supply side policy, particularly if you then argue that that might lead to increased investment, for example. Um, intervention, I think point two is really important. So intervention is things like interventions designed to reduce relative poverty, income inequality, including things like minimum wages, social housing. There was a little bit of chat uh, before the session started about universal basic income. And I posed the question, is that a supply side policy? 
in many ways, it's a fiscal policy, but is it a fiscal supply side policy? It would certainly have supply side effects. James Barrow asked a really interesting question, which I just wanted to pick up on. Can you use externalities diagrams in paper two? And the answer is yes. Uh, particularly if you're if you're showing infrastructure, I've got a better diagram to use on that one, James. I would be a little wary about going to it as your first choice diagram. I think you're probably better off using AD AS analysis if that's okay. The third one is provision of public and merit goods. Now I know merit goods doesn't occur in every syllabus, but things like investment in human capital, in vocation, education, healthcare, uh, flood defence schemes, all that kind of stuff. Big, big project based uh, stuff, including better better uh, um, energy networks, water and sanitation systems. Just a really key point coming up in the next slide. Now, I want to emphasize this, please, because uh, I get into trouble when I say this <laughs> with my students. I keep telling them, by the way, that education is not a supply side policy. So I'll just say it again. I don't think education is a supply side policy. Education is a word. So please avoid generic answers on supply side. In fact, this is, this is the aim of the next five minutes, just thinking ahead. I want to give you loads of specific examples just to add to your revision notes, if that's okay with you. you a lot of students say, oh, yeah, the government could spend more on education and training. There's nothing wrong with that statement, by the way. It's, there's nothing wrong with it. it. But it's a bit like a lighthouse outside the tutor to office. I mean, it's, it provides some illumination, but it's not very useful to say that, okay? Mm -hmm. You need to be more specific in this section of the course. You need to go into a little bit more granular detail to get those top marks. The more detail you go into, the easier it becomes to evaluate. Let me show you what I mean by that. Here, and so instead of writing, the government could increase spending on education. You might write instead, the government could increase real spending. Okay, for early years education, such as offering tax free childcare, or instead focus extra spending on investing in higher per capita funding for post 16 education, including vocational qualifications, such as T levels, paid apprenticeships, and perhaps subsidized placements for long term youth unemployed. Can you see the difference? Maybe take a screenshot if you, if you, you don't want to do a download here, but can you see the difference between the green and the blue there? The green is not wrong but it doesn't really get you very far. The blue is detailed, it's granular, it's applied. And once you've written that little bit there, you can then say, well, which is more important, early years education or post-16 education? You can evaluate to a much higher level. With supply side policies, everybody, please, please, please go into more granular detail. Now, in that context, the next slide, you might want to take a quick screenshot of, or download the PowerPoint at the end of the session, which we'll put on the Tutor Two side. I just wanted to give you some very specific supply side policies. You might be able to add even more in chat. So please keep an eye on the chat window as well. Privatization, the last major one was Royal Mail. Channel 4 is proposed as a privatization. The Act of Parliament's not yet gone through. Deregulation of the energy market, good example, of course. They allowed lots of new energy firms to come in, many of whom have gone bust. Uh, those of you who see my water industry profile will know that there's now competition for Business businesses in water supplies. The government's created eight new free ports and regional enterprise zones around the country. The government provides £500 every three months for each child in terms of tax free childcare. They've created 20 institutes of technology, the new T levels, Bricklaying, uh, et cetera, which are equivalent to A levels. They've launched a new national skills fund. There's the kickstart scheme for long-term unemployed people who've been out of work for at least a year. The government brought in the apprenticeship levy where businesses of a certain size have to put 0.5% of their wage bill into a fund. The fund training hasn't necessarily been successful. The big increase in the minimum wage is a supply side policy. The reforms to immigration post-Brexit represents a change in labor supply policy. Big one there, a lot of small businesses are using the super deduction tax incentive. So, that basically gives you a, a 125% tax allowance for investments in new computers and things. You can write that off against your corporation tax. And then those big infrastructure projects. Everybody, everybody says HS2. So my strong advice to you on Monday, unless it comes up, which it might do, is not to mention HS2. Because it hasn't really, but well, it's nowhere near finished. Uh, Lower Thames Crossing, the London Super Sewer. 
uh, the funding for rollout of electric vehicle charging infrastructure, the UK Gigabyte gig project, the shared rural network, etc., trying to bring 5G, uh, relaxing planning for renewables. This is specific. This is specific. And uh, I, I think what I'd love you to do, uh, students in Monday, if you get a supply, a really juicy supply side question, is just have one or two very specific examples that you can refer to. So maybe that was useful. Hopefully not. Hopefully it was. Infrastructure comes up a lot. The Economist, which I'm sure many of you read, uh, calls infrastructure the economic arteries and the veins. What a, what a fantastic, what a fantastic way of describing it. The roads, the ports, the power lines, the wires that enable people, goods, commodities, energy information to move about efficiently. So infrastructure spending is an important aspect of supply side policies. And it links very closely to fiscal policy, does it not? Here's the diagram that you could well draw. Heathrow, third runaway, Ella, a good point. I would draw this kind of diagram for infrastructure because infrastructure, I think, is triple powered. Triple powered. What do I mean by that? First of all, if you get the infrastructure right, and uh, hopefully Crossrail too is a good Crossrail is a good example of that, and, and other often smaller projects, you know, local bypasses, improvements in. Uh, new train services, new train lines, for example. Uh, it's triple powered. Why? One, because it shifts out aggregate demand. It's an increase in government spending, often funded by, by borrowing. So AD1 shifts out to AD2. Better infrastructure also brings down costs for firms. Think about the cost of delivery drivers and vans and what have you, logistics companies. So if you get more efficient infrastructure, fewer delays, lower transport costs, effectively shifts out short run aggregate supply, which is essentially the economy's cost curve. And it also can shift out long run aggregate supply from LS to LIS2. So in that sense, the economy could increase output from Y1 to Y2 and sustain higher demand without there being inflation. So this would be my go to diagram for a question on the potential benefits of infrastructure spending. It's a really good diagram. It's developed You've shifted three curves, and of course, you can then furnish this diagram with some good examples. That would be my go-to diagram. Let's have a go at a question. I, I've been, I, I'm not trying to question spot here. I'm just trying to think about something of interest to me. You'll know that the minimum wage has gone up in April. £9.50, is it £9.51? I think I rounded down here for adult workers. And of course, there's lower rates now for younger workers, they bought the apprenticeship rate in line with the under 18 rate. Interestingly, it was below. They found a lot of people were working for Subway, <laughs> 17 year olds working for Subway, uh, rather than taking an apprenticeship. But the minimum wage has gone up a lot this year. So here's my question coming up on the screen. Can you in chat, please give me three advantages of a higher minimum wage as an interventionist supply side policy. What can you come up with? I'd be fascinated to see. Have a go. Yeah, I'm nodding my head, not, not because of the music or Jim's guitar playing because of the superb answers. A lot of people mentioning work incentives, and I would definitely include that in my, in my, um, in my uh, answer. Charlie Ross, bigger incentive to work, more productive workers, increases AD from higher consumption. Charlie must be a Keynesian, we think. Who knows? Uh, maybe one more coming in, if we can spot a couple of others. Theo talks about increases the number of people who are willing to become economically active. Excellent point. That links in, I think, Theo, with the um, with the incentives argument, the work incentives argument. And can we find one more? Conscious of time here. There's loads of good answers coming through. Uh, okay, Alex increases income, meaning consumption will increase, likely increase. Well done, Alex. Hedging word. Tax revenues might go up. Uh, higher incentive to work, lower unemployment, and less spending on benefits. Those are good answers. Can I just take you through my three points, if that's okay with you? 
I try to focus here on minimum wage as a supply side policy rather than just gains from a minimum wage, if that makes sense. So first of all, it improves work incentives. Lots of people mention that, which is great. I would then add in the concept of the unemployment trap. So in, you're trying to increase the payoff to working rather than remaining inactive or on welfare. So it improves work incentives, maybe helps reduce the unemployment trap, which then increases the economy's active labor force. We mentioned economic inactivity there, which can then increase long and aggregate supply. The second point, of course, is it could well lead to higher productivity. And quite a few people in the chat were talking about efficiency wage theory. Don't worry if your teachers haven't covered that. Basic idea is people's morale and psychology is affected positively by paying people higher wages. Aldi, by the way, as a supermarket, they understand that because they pay the highest wages in the supermarket sector by some distance, actually. Uh, so a higher minimum wage could increase productivity. And of course, productivity is a supply side factor. And crucially, of course, the key is to link it to the supply side. Here we go, an increase in work incomes, increased in work income, sorry, lifts aggregate demand. You could bring in the idea of propensity to consume there uh, and reduces welfare claims because if people are earning more, there are fewer people claiming welfare. Don't forget one third of people on universal credit claim benefits, uh, are in work, sorry, uh, really important. So it says, could you use the back, backward bending supply curve for point one? You could, you could as an evaluation point, maybe, uh, point one. Uh, welfare goes down. This gives the government more finances to spend on public sector capital investment projects. In other words, a successful minimum wage could lift incomes, bring down the benefit bill, and that releases money that the government could spend elsewhere, perhaps on some local public sector investment projects. Uh, great, great answers there from you all. Uh, better than my answers, but those are my three points. Let's evaluate. Almost there, everybody. Uh, I'm fascinated to see what you come up with here. Can you give me some disadvantages of a higher minimum wage as a supply side policy? 30 seconds. Here we go. Wow, yeah, some great answers. I think Jim picked out four or five there, all of which were absolutely top, top answers. From Gabriella, from Rosemary, from Amber. Amber talks about causing cost push inflation. They also lead to job cuts and increased unemployment. These are you know, well understood, important potential disadvantages of minimum wage. Lisa says the following high minimum wage can cause price inflation as firms pass on high wages and higher prices, falling employment as demand contracts and rising unemployment as supply extends. Yeah. Luke talks about increased business costs and less business investment hurting aggregate supply. Luke's point is really good because it links the disadvantages to the supply side. So the really strong answers there will link to supply side. Henrik talks about firms raising price, a lack of flexibility due to wage stickiness. That's the idea that wages cluster around the minimum wage or just above and, and encourages automation in labor markets, which actually could be an advantage, of course automation creates as many jobs as it destroys according to some people let me go take you through my three disadvantages again i'm trying to link to supply side so it might be damaging particularly to small businesses many small businesses have just just about survived the pandemic the median profit of a small business is something like somewhere between six and ten thousand pounds a year it's really small so a higher minimum wage would would eat into those profits and risk business failures. And if businesses fail, that affects aggregate supply. A rising unit labor costs for exporters, possible loss of competitiveness, which would affect demand, and maybe a fall in export investment as a result, which affects supply. And uh, rising labor costs reduces profits, which might cause a fall in business investment, downside effects on aggregate supply. Again, the key thing is, if this is an essay, you have to use your own knowledge. So if some industries affected, is a data response question, uh, use the extracts. I'm very conscious that I've used up again over half an hour of your time. I just want to make a couple of points just to finish with and then throw a question your way to think about. 
If you get a question about the effectiveness of policy, and that could be monetary or fiscal or supply side or all of them, if you get a question on effectiveness in the question, to get high marks of evaluation, you must discuss at least one alternative policy or another alternative intervention. That doesn't have to be in, in, in every paragraph, but somewhere in the answer, there must be some alternative discussed. It could be in your final conclusion, but it must appear somewhere in the answer. On Monday, questions on effectiveness, think, oh, yep, Jeff, talk to me, I've got to, got to mention alternatives. Okay. Second, final point of exam goal is the following. Uh, in revision, you will focus on clearly identified supply side policies. Hopefully this session's given you a little bit of detail on that to add to your already great revision notes. But please remember, that we've done a session on monetary and fiscal and supply side in the last couple of days. Monetary and fiscal policies have supply side effects. So tax changes, interest rate changes, exchange rate changes. Monetary and fiscal policy are demand side policies for the exam, but they also have supply side effects. So don't please revise all three, not as isolated topics, just as topics within the scope of what let's call it economic policy, monetary, fiscal, supply side. If you see it as a whole, often little bits of the jigsaw start to fit together right at the end, maybe even the day of day or day or so before the exam. So good luck with that. Let me leave you with uh, two things. One is a thank you to amazing answers in chat. They really are incredible. We have a very talented, we're just saying actually beforehand in the production room, we think the answers this year in the live streams are as good, probably better than we've had in previous years. The standard is insane. Here's a question. I just thought, I'd, here's a question. I'm going to, again, I'm going to do an essay plan on this tonight and I'll do a video on it tomorrow. But maybe have a go. In 2020, there was a 9.5% fall in the UK real GDP, the deepest recession for decades. In 2009, there was another recession in which real GDP fell by 6%. That was after the global financial crisis, wasn't it? Here's the question. Now, this is, by the way, this is a hard question. Assess the contribution which supply side reforms, supply side policies, might make in helping avoid major recessions in the UK economy. If Carlsberg did essay questions, that's the essay question they would set. I will, I will have a go at this one tonight. I'll post a video up on it, but maybe you have a go as well and uh, see what you think. There we go. I've got a couple of minutes before we finish. Uh, that's our session on supply side pretty much done. I am very happy to take any questions. Josh says, what are the real benefits of deregulation? Well, at a micro level, they make markets more contestable. They often are a stimulus for more efficiency, allocative, productive and dynamic. But of course, there are dangers from light touch regulation, Josh. If you think about financial markets, the light touch, light touch regulation may be a factor behind the, the last crisis and the deregulation of the energy market. Well, that hasn't gone well at all. So that would be my answer to that. Uh, can we bring, Lisa says, can we bring behavioral economics to evaluate in macro? The answer is yes, but I wouldn't, maybe in financial questions, actually behavioral finance, but I wouldn't be using it too much. They are a useful tool, getting people to save more, for example, save for a pension, et cetera. Um, probably more relevant to micro, but I wouldn't be against it, Lisa. You'd have to make it relevant to the context. A couple more questions. Hopefully we've got some good ones coming through. I will put them on the screen. Ah, uh, yes. Thanks, Don. Thanks for that question. Jeff, do you think that John Joe Shelby will win Ballon d'Or next year? Well, if he doesn't, he's only got his shelves to blame. Pardon me. No, I think uh, it'd be great, though, because we need somebody who's lacking air to win the Ballon d'Or. A lot says, how can we best prepare for paper three after paper two? Well, take a deep breath after paper two, because you've got a week. The key is you've done most of the revision. I'd say you've done 90% 90, 90 of revision for paper three. You just have to go to your exam board and know precisely what each board wants. So AQA, of course, it's that, it's that report style, isn't it? Ed Excel, micro and macro appears in the 225 mark questions. So I would, you've got a great base of revision lots after paper one and two, take a breath, and then really focus on the synoptic techniques that apply to your particular board. And we'll be there with you, we'll be supporting you 
along the way uh, in the week ahead of paper three. And we're not, we're not finishing after paper one. Kim asked a great question. What infrastructure projects should we learn? Up to you. Uh, I'm a UK based economist. I tend to use projects that are in the UK, transport projects, for example, HS, HS3, in my big opinion, would better than HS2, but Crossrail, uh, London Super Sewer. Often time, by the way, when we do this, development economics is paper three, isn't it, for Red Excel? And often the infrastructure projects there, there's lots of really good examples from solar panels in, in Morocco to, uh, to off grid renewables in Kenya. There's some amazing projects you can choose there. Amber says, are we credited for micro points in paper two, such as economies of scale as a benefit of globalization? The answer, Amber, is undoubtedly yes. And thank you for asking it because economies of scale challenges the assumption of constant returns to scale in the theory of trade. One of the benefits of globalization is we get those big scale economies. So the answer is yes. Rafi says, why did short and aggregate spires shift on the infrastructure? Yeah, okay, my point there, Rafi, was that if you get better infrastructure, for example, the road, oh, there we go, here's our diagram. If you get better roads, more efficient transport systems, uh, faster broadband, that kind of stuff, uh, the costs of businesses go down. It's not, it's not, they can produce more, it's just they have lower costs. If you think about a big, yeah, you know, think about a business like Amazon, for example, with thousands of vehicles, Amazon Prime lorries and vans across the country, their costs go up when infrastructure creaks at the seams. Their costs will go down if they got really good infrastructure, because there's just less transport congestion, less delay, you don't have to pay workers triple time to drive through the night. So oftentimes infrastructure can bring down the short run costs of lots of businesses. And that shifts out aggregate supply. I hope that answers your question. It also has a big increase in potential increase in potential output, hence the outward shift in long run supply. So Ab says, which country profiles would you recommend? One developing, one developed. Probably, uh, you may well use it in paper two if you're thinking at Excel. I'd be more focused on that for paper three. I might be wrong, but paper three, development economics appears on paper three. So I'd be really ready for that. Uh, Either way, if you've got some already, I would be using, I've told my students, for example, to have four, one of which must be sub-Saharan African country, Kenya, Ethiopia, or what have you. At least one must be emerging Asia, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Indonesia. One of which should probably be South American, Mexico, Brazil. And one of which should be European nation, but not the UK. I don't know, Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, who knows? Just, just countries that, where there's something to say, choose a country you're interested in for a start. Well, we're quite close to the exams now, but choose something where you can just get a little bit of background information that, that it's going to stick, isn't it? If you revise it now, you're not going to forget it. In a question, Victoria asked this question, in a question on supply side policies, could we talk about monetary and fiscal policy effects on the supply side, or we just mention them? Okay, so it obviously depends on the question, but there are things called fiscal supply side policies. So if you're talking about cutting income tax as a way of boosting and in work incentives, that's a fiscal policy, but it's a supply side policy. If you're talking about the effects of uh, quantitative easing by the Bank of England, bringing down interest rates, bond yields, and causing government spending to go up on infrastructure, that, that has a supply side effect. So my advice there, Victoria, is, is you can bring it into the discussion. Don't, don't weight it too heavily because you've got to focus on supply side policies, but don't be afraid to talk about monetary and fiscal policy effects. That'll be absolutely fine. And you'll be credited for that. And maybe time for one more question. Do you have to specify whether a supply side is an interventionist or free market? No, you don't. You may get a question which asks you to make that distinction, but I would, if you, if you're aware of the difference, you've got good examples. I would, I would include it in the answer it shows your knowledge and command of economics and that's uh, that's always a good thing in exams isn't it especially if you're taking an economics paper maybe one more uh oh gosh this is a, a moving moment jeff when i'm done with economics and never see you again i'll be sad well you're very kind you're very kind but what's more important it's not about me is it it's not about me at all it's about you and it's about your exams and doing the best you possibly can on that note couple of housekeeping points before we finish. We've got two sessions on Sunday, a UK economy special at 5pm, a paper two warm up session clinic, 
crisis crisis mo crisis center moment in 7 p.m on sunday then we'll have six topic sessions plus the two there's loads of other videos loads of stuff on the youtube channel already if you need a question answering or a topic you want to link to just post an answer a question in the in the comment section below i'll be in there tonight i'll just do my best to answer as many questions as possible on that note huge thanks for everybody who's joined in quite a few of you've been to all six which is amazing and we never take that for granted so thank you for that have a great weekend with revision i hope it goes well see you on sunday take care stay happy stay positive all the best <laughs>